Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the August 29th, 2022 meeting of our Menlo Park Planning Commission. We're glad you've decided to be with us this evening. Established by state law, our Planning Commission is composed of seven volunteer voting age residents of Menlo Park appointed to four-year terms by the City Council. Our Planning Commission is not a policy setting body, that's the City Council. We are a policy implementing body. We review development proposals on public and private lands for compliance with our city's general plan and zoning ordinance, which can be found on the city website. The commission reviews all development proposals requiring a use permit, architectural control, variance, minor subdivision, and environmental review associated with these projects. And in these regards, the commission is the final decision-making body unless appealed to the city council. In addition, the commission also serves as a recommending body to the city council for major subdivisions, rezonings, conditional development permits, zoning ordinance amendments, general plan amendments, and the environmental reviews and below market rate or BMR housing agreements associated with those projects. We work in close partnership. Indeed, we greatly rely on our staff of the city's planning division. They are responsible for coordinating the enforcement of the city's zoning ordinance and related policies concerning applications for residential, commercial, and industrial development projects. If this is your first time at a planning commission meeting this evening, we are really glad that you're here and we encourage your active participation, whether you're an applicant or an interested member of the public. And for now, I'm gonna turn it over to associate planner Recruiter to tell you how you can participate this evening. Good evening and thank you, uh, Chair DeCarty. Thank you, Planning Commissioners and members of the public as well. Uh, for this evening's Planning Commission meeting, the Planning Commissioners will have their webcams on for the duration of the meeting. For those presenting on an item for tonight's agenda, we ask kindly that you also turn on your microphone and webcam during your presentation for your actual item. A member of staff will assign you keyboard and mouse controls if you're displaying a presentation. We then kindly ask that you turn off your webcam and microphone when you are done with the presentation portion of your item, unless called upon by the chair. During the public comment period, members of the public will have an opportunity to share their comments or questions by clicking on the hand icon located on your screen, upon which staff will introduce you and activate your microphone. Alternatively, for those of you who are calling uh, by telephone for tonight's meeting, please press star nine on your keypad to notify staff that you have a comment. And for any members of the public who are sharing a Zoom account or phone line with another commenter during this meeting, please inform staff at the start of your public comment and staff will ensure that the other commenter speaks after you have made your comment. With that said, I hand it back to you, Chair DeCarty. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pruder. So with that, let's get started. We'll begin with roll call. I'll ask each commissioner to unmute themselves and to verbally respond. I will try to do this in alphabetical order, beginning with Commissioner Barnes. Chair DeCarty, good evening to you and the rest of the commission. <laughs> I'm here. It's good to have you. Uh, commissioner Doe. I'm here, good evening. Vice Chair Harris. Hi everyone. Commissioner okay. Riggs. Present and good evening. Commissioner Tate. Good evening. Commissioner Thomas. Good evening. And I am Chris DeCarty. My pronouns are he, him, and I am chair of the Planning Commission. Uh, so for our next item, I think I'm going to turn back to Associate Planner Pruder for reports and announcements. Oh, I'm not. I'm turning to Sandemeyer. I apologize. I, I'm sorry about that. Um, I really sorry about that. To our acting principal planner for city, Corinna Sandemeyer, for reports and announcements. My apologies. Yeah, no problem. Uh, good evening, Chair DeCarty and Commissioners. Um, I don't have anything to any reports or announcements at this time, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions uh, at this time from folks? All right. So seeing none, um, I will close item C and move to D, which is public comment. Under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject not listed on the agenda. And items listed under consent calendar. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. 
please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live. The commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the commission cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. And now I will turn it back to Mr. Pruder to guide us through any public comment this evening. Thank you, Chair DeCarty. Uh, at this time, I don't see any commenters who have, or I should say anyone who's raised their hand requesting permission to speak publicly at this time. Happy to wait a moment if you'd like. Uh, at this time. Sure, we can wait just a moment. I don't think we have a large crowd this evening. All right, anybody? I still see no hands raised, so if you'd like, you may proceed. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and close public comment. Item D, we'll turn to item E, which is the consent calendar. <clears throat> we have three items on the consent calendar, items E1, E2, and E3. Before we vote, would a commissioner like to pull any or all of those items from the consent calendar for discussion or proposed amendment? All right, seeing none, then we will take the entire consent calendar uh, for approval. Do I have a motion for approval? I see a hand from Commissioner Barnes as a first. Do I have a second? I have a second, uh, I think, Commissioner Doe, is that your hand, is that correct? Okay. Yes. So with that, let's go ahead and again, um, if we can all verbally respond in alphabetical order for the consent calendar. Commissioner Barnes? Yes. Commissioner Doe? Yes. Vice Chair Harris? Yes. Commissioner Riggs? Abstain. Commissioner Tate? Abstain. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. I will vote yes as well. I think that's Five yays, two abstentions, the consent calendar is approved. Moving right along, we are now to the uh, substance of our program this evening, uh, which is the public hearing, which is item F. And we will begin with item F1, which is a use permit for 816 Laurel Avenue. This is a request for a use permit to demolish an existing one-story single-family residence and construct a new two-story residence on a substandard lot with regard to minimum lot width and area in the R1U, that's our single-family urban residential zoning district. Uh, and with that, let me turn it over to Associate Planner Pruder um, for uh, any staff additions. Good evening again, Chair DeCarty. Thank you very much. At this time, we don't have any announcements or updates, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions uh, from the commission. All right. Before we turn to the applicant, any questions of staff on this item? Clarifying? All right. Let's go ahead and turn to the applicant. I believe, Ms. Felver, you're with us this evening, and I'm turning it over to you. Good evening, Chair DeCarty and Commissioner. Anna Felver with Thomas James Holmes. Nice to see you this evening. I do have a short presentation. We can pull that up. I'll be presenting 816 Laurel Avenue. This is again in the R1U zoning. Uh, we have a lot size of 5264 square feet in area, which is under the minimum 7,000 square feet for that zoning, which is why we're here for um, a use permit. We also have a 43 foot, four inch wide lot which is much smaller than the required 65 foot minimum lot size. Um, we are demoing a existing home of 1,165 square feet, including a, an attached one car garage. And we'll be proposing a new two story residence. Trying to change to the next slide. There we go. So with North at the top, our site is 816 Laurel. We'll change again. <laughs> 
uh, our site there again, the 5264 square feet lot, and it is quite narrow. Um, we do have two existing single story homes left adjacent to the property. Across Chester Street, there is a two story home. And then we to the right, we have a single story home. And on the right corner, we have a two story home, just to kind of lay out the neighborhood a bit. These are some images. The top three images, left is left adjacent to the property. The middle is right adjacent to the property. And the one all the way to the right is across the property. And then below we have uh, the two story that's across Chester. We have one of several two story homes. It's off of Durham, that's the center image. And then to the right, we have that corner right lot that is also a two story. A lot of the materials in the neighborhood are horizontal siding. We have board and batten being seen here. Um, there's a little bit of stucco in the neighborhood. There's craftsman style, traditional style, and then you see the, the modern transitional style there. So very eclectic in the immediate area. And you could see there's a lot of two store, two car garages as well as the one car garage that's on the left and at the middle bottom picture. So we're proposing a two story transitional style home. A lot of classic features are being used or traditional features, if you will. The horizontal siding is being used on the first and second story we have, um, which is frequently seen in the context. We have a heavy eave trim that speaks to the traditional styles in the neighborhood. Hip roof combined with that Dutch gable treatment in the front. And then these elements combined with this minimalist black framed window and uh, format, and then also having a modern garage door and a modern um, transitional style. Uh, front door uh, it is, is a good blend for a transitional design. It fits well within the surrounding neighborhood and also provides the homeowners with their desired aesthetic. The color selection, as you see in front of you, is an off-white with some dark accents to match the dark framed windows. We're about 27 feet and eight inches of proposed height up to the highest ridge line. Uh, this is below the 28 foot max. Uh, we're as high as we are uh, due to the average natural grade, it's about two feet under the, the finished floor height as we're dealing with the grade on site. You can't really see from these conceptual images, um, but we do have a nine foot plate on the first floor and we've dropped our second plate to eight foot seven to make sure we can accommodate um, the, the daylight plane and make sure we're below um, that max height. With the hip roof and the lower plate height, uh, uh, we're trying to reduce the massing as well that's at the top. And you can see that garage first story element is projecting out and it sets the second floor then sets back from that. And then the left half of the home, of course, is set back even further than that to, again, reduce massing as seen from the street. And these are the 2D elevations. Top is the front, bottom is the rear. The left elevation, the right elevation, a little bit more articulation along the sides, and I'll show you and plan why those moves and what the design intent were behind that. Oops. I went too fast. Can I go back one? There we go. Um, to the left is the existing lot and, and the existing home. To the right is our proposed residence. The light gray without the dot hatching, that's landscape. Uh, that's the first floor and then the dark gray setback is, is that second floor. Uh, since we have a narrow lot, it was important to have the mapping be centralized on the site. Therefore, we can provide relief to the left and the right edges, which are single story homes. The plan width then steps back. As you can see, it, it starts to get less in width and, and very narrow towards the back. And this step is on, on purpose to, again, provide more relief to the left and the right. Uh, while still providing usable livable space for the homeowners. And you can see it echoes the courtyard space on the left-hand side. So again, being thoughtful of respecting, you know, sunlight that the, the neighbor may want in their courtyard and, and has voiced uh, that they would like in their courtyard. To align with the neighborhood, you can see that the dark, the footprint and that dark shading does not go or exceed the two adjacent lots. And then that's also to respect the, the rear yard space for both neighbors. You can see we're 36 feet back from the property line and we only need to be 20 foot minimum. 
So we're, we're allowing more generous space there. And of course, for rear yard space for the homeowners. Uh, we have a total of 10 trees that we analyzed. One is quite large um, on the left hand, front left hand side there. That's the Coast Live Oak that's off site. We have nine trees on site. Oops, let's go back one. Sorry. Uh, eight trees that are non protected. They're privet trees with major problems. Neighbors have concerns about them. We want to remove them. Um, the one that's it, with a red X over it is a protected tree that's on site. This is the Japanese maple. We have submitted an HTR supporting document to the city arborist for review of uh, an approval. And we are replacing the tree with um, what has been a, uh, approved already. Uh, four trees, two 36 inch box trees. And you'll see that on the right image, the two green trees in the back. And then there's a smaller tree in the back that's the 24 inch replacement tree. And then we have one towards the front, left front is 24 inch box as well. Uh, in our documents, if we were to keep the tree and push the house all the way back, this is not in alignment with the adjacent homes. It's also within the required setback. So and we'd be missing out on a driveway and a garage feature for, for the homeowners. So it was um, best for the site, uh, usability for the site to remove that tree and provide the adequate replacement. We also are adding extra trees, um, as you can see in the back row there next to the 24 inch box and then in the front as well to complement the architecture. A little bit about our journey in this process. Um, privacy has been a concern from the neighbors. So we uh, originally had a trellis on the back of the house. We had a primary bedroom on the second floor. When you put a primary bedroom in the middle of a plan, you have to have egress windows on the sides. And this was not received well from the, from the neighbors. We relocated the primary bedroom towards the back, put egress windows on the rear wall so that we could raise up the sills on the sides. And we removed the trellis that was in the back. And you can see this change here, primary bedroom in the back there. All the yellow is highlighting the windows that we actually raised up. And this is above the floor. Um, four foot six, as we have a low head plate height and head height, it starts a little bit lower than usual for windows. Um, usually they start at eight feet. Um, so these windows are, are still providing privacy for the neighbors. We've shown the neighbors that we've raised them um, and they're happy to hear that we're being thoughtful in, in, in that um, of their privacy. A shadow study was also requested um, again, courtyard spaces and rear yard spaces are very important to the neighbors. So we actually did a, um, a massing study here. This is June, so you're gonna have the sun above most of the time and you're gonna have lower shadows. Um, mainly the shadows from the second floor hit our own property. You're gonna have fence lines, of course, that shadow into adjacent properties. For, for the most part, there won't be any um, impact on those courtyards and rear yard spaces. We also do a December study. This is, of course, going to have really long shadows so where it's expected to have shadowing in neighbors yards whether you're a one story or a two story so making sure that we show that it this will occur in the winter and to wrap that up um, about our neighbor outreach again we reached out to the neighbors 300 foot radius back in january had um, and hosted a meeting via zoom on january 26 to collect that feedback as soon as we collected that feedback, we made these changes with the windows along the sides um, and looked at how we can rearrange our floor plan to, to provide more privacy. And we updated our drawings and sent out copies in April. And uh, more concerns that were um, expressed were about, you know, how, what process, the tree removal process and what kind of replacements are gonna be done. Um, the size of the home, specifically the two car garage, the desire for one car, but there's a lot of two car garages um, on site. So making sure that we communicate that two car garages allow for less on street parking, more off street parking than it's desired by the homeowners. And then of course, uh, the typical questions we get about demo and construction and we're coordinating with them on those items and we'll continue to coordinate. So thank you for your time tonight. That's all I have for the presentation. 
We have our team here tonight and our architect, Teresa, with the city and Lagoni. And to conclude our presentation, we have our homeowners on the call and they'd like to introduce themselves. Uh, I think their uh, participants is under Raj. You could raise your hand so they could be unmuted. Actually, it looks like they may be in the attendees. Oh, yes, the um, attendees. They're in, under the attendees. And I think they're and yes. Hi, Raj. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, permission. Um, this is Raj and Deepak and our little, our one-year-old Rian. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we are super excited. Um, thank you for your time today to review our project. Um, and um, we are really looking forward to calling Menlo Park home. We love the neighborhood below. Um, and um, yeah, thank you for giving us your time today. Yeah, and we're excited to have the next part of our journey with, with, with that neighborhood. So thanks again for your consideration. All right, thank you. Any questions for the applicant? Anybody on the applicant team before we open for public comment? Commissioners? All right, let's go ahead and open public comment. Mr. Pruder, why don't you lead us through? Thank you again, Sherry Cardi. At this time, um, members of the public can publicly comment on this item by raising their hand or pressing star nine if they're dialing in by phone. And I don't see any hands raised at this time, but I'm happy to wait a moment if you prefer. Yeah, we can wait a moment. We need like the Jeopardy music to play for us or something. All right, anybody? See no hands, so I believe if you'd like, you may proceed. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and close public comment. We'll bring it back to the virtual dais for commissioners for any comments or questions uh, of uh, staff or the applicant who would like to begin. Commissioner Riggs. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to comment and um, I uh, overall I have to say this is um, uh, a design that should be welcome in the neighborhood. Um, buildings are going to be two stories and um, the hope is that the design is sensitive to the to the neighbors and I find this design not just the windows but uh, the massing uh, and the response that uh, Ms. Felver has reported uh, in their interaction with the neighbor, it's, it's all uh, showing a great deal of sensitivity. And uh, <clears throat> I hope this is noted when um, people uh, talk about uh, this particular developer because it hasn't always been so, uh, I mean, the, the references. So um, I'm quite in support and uh, when the chair would entertain it, I'd be uh, happy to move approval. All right, thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Any other commissioner comments or questions? Or indeed a motion. Commissioner Barnes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I find this project to be certainly approvable. Um, it clears the benchmarks for zoning ordinance development standards, be it for setbacks, lot coverage, FAL, daylight plane, parking, and height. Um, I think we, we have a 43 foot wide lot. So it is it's quite constricted. And I think the efforts that were made to narrow in the back, uh, the siting on the particular parcel, uh, demonstrate efforts by the the applicant and the homeowner um, to fit into the neighborhood and and work with neighbors that frankly had expressed desires and I think that the applicant met those desires with tangible 
modifications, which um, you know, sometimes is or is not required or is the case. So I think they went above and beyond. Um, you know, from an aesthetic standpoint, uh, there's not a lot you can do on a 43 foot wide lot to be less garage. I mean, this is you know, visually uh, a wonderful, uh, the house is wonderfully architected. Uh, it's a shame that the garage is so prominent uh, in front. And I suspect that's why some of the, the first images that were shown were also to show how some of the surrounding houses have garages that are prominent. And I'm sure that was you know, done um, in previous years. We've been trying to get away from that as a planning commission, but I don't think that's a, I, I think that's unavoidable um, in this instance. So with that said, for those reasons, for the clearing the development standards hurdles, for the work with the neighbors and for the aesthetics, um, I'm happy to go ahead and make a motion. Uh, for uh, approval of the project per the staff report. So we have a motion to approve per the staff report. Uh, commissioner would like to second or have further discussion or questions. Commissioner Riggs? Yeah, I'll second. Great, all right. So we have a first and a second on the staff report as submitted. Uh, any questions or comments from commissioners before we move to a vote? Commissioner Tate. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I missed um, uh, public comment. Uh, we did open public comment and close public comment. There, oh, okay. There, there okay. just was none. So. Oh, okay. Because so. I, I see other people in the attendees now, so I just wasn't, I missed it. Okay. Thank you for asking. Always good to help. I'm now going to pause. I believe we did open and close public comment. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, thank you. Um, before going to vote, I, um, I, I have a question of staff. Um, I, I concur with the comments of Commissioners um, Riggs and Barnes. Um, uh, the question I have is about the heritage tree policy and the application. And Ms. Felber, thank you for your explanation of why for development purposes that Japanese maple had to come down. To me, this is um, application of our new heritage tree policy. And we are seeing a lot of these come through with taking down heritage trees for this criteria five, which is the development uh, criteria. And I, my question is, how is that being applied? So the criteria states the heritage tree interferes with A, proposed development, repair, alteration, or improvement of a site, or B, heritage tree is causing contributing to structural damage to a habitable building. Well, it's not B here, so it's A, proposed development, repair, alteration, or improvement. And there is no financially feasible and reasonable design alternative that would permit preservation of the heritage tree. So given how we value heritage trees here, and given, and this is a great example of the value of the home being proposed as designed and placed versus what would need to happen otherwise. My question for staff is, how is this being determined? And if this was a hundred year old heritage oak tree in exactly that same spot, would that tree have come down too using the criteria as it's established right now? Thank you for your question. Chair Ducardi, I think to open uh, with that response, um, I apologize for the barking in my background, um, but uh, I would just add, start with that, the, the key thing that is a part of the development-based removal process is valuation of trees and appraisal value. And so I think there may be something that could be said about appraisal values differing between say a hundred year old uh, version of the tree and a more a younger type of tree perhaps that may not be a, a great difference, maybe not significant, but that's something to consider as a possible factor. Um, but I would also add that, you know, per the heritage tree ordinance, the applicant has worked with their, in terms of their own consulting arborist and city arborist to determine what the assessed value of all the trees on site is. And then the assessed value of a specific tree they're proposing to remove and in the development based guidelines that are enshrined in the heritage tree ordinance, they have, you know, created a 
particular combination of replanting measures that accommodate that value. And they've also looked at alternative uh, you know, approaches that would achieve a, a different perhaps layout and different you know, construction that would have resulted in a value that exceeded a certain threshold. And that threshold uh, to my understanding is between 110 and 130% of the proposed value of, of what they're desiring to construct. And so that's really the key difference here. And, and factoring in those valuations based on the appraisals is, is really, I think, paramount to the determination that's made. And then I'd also add uh, additionally that this undergoes its own separate appeal period process. Members of the public uh, who have reside or own property within a 300 foot radius are receive a separate notice. There's public noticing that is provided for 15 days at the site itself. Uh, so there's an opportunity as well to appeal that decision and uh, no appeals were filed, of course. And so that also was a part of this process um, in case there was a sensitivity surrounding the tree and there were any concerns. We did not receive anything beyond what the applicant has already discussed and we provided in our staff report in terms of their work with the neighbors in, in the vicinity of their property and understanding what the needs of the, the neighborhood and adjacent adjoining properties are. Uh, thank you for that. That was an excellent ex explanation. I really appreciate it. Um, having served on the Environmental Quality Commission, and I, I know Commissioner Barnes did as well, um, I think this is an excellent application of uh, the changes that we saw as a city for the heritage tree policy, the replacement trees and the positioning here um, relative to what's being lost is far superior to what the old policy would have put in place, um, and including then getting this sequenced in the right way so it doesn't trip people up in the mix. So in this instance, I think this works really well and I, I think is a testament to the hard work that many put this new policy in place. I do have a concern at the back at that far end um, of valuating um, trees like these massive old oaks that come down. I think that can get tricky in certain circumstances, but as you note, there are appeals process for, for that, Mr. Pruder, and, and folks have an opportunity to do that. Um, so thank you for the explanation and the time. That was my, my clarifying uh, question in this mix. So we have a first and a second. A any other clarifying questions before we go to a vote? All right, seeing none, again, in alphabetical order, Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Commissioner Doe. Yes. Vice Chair Harris. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Uh, I will vote yes as well. That's seven votes in favor. Um, congratulations to you and your family. Um, enjoy your new home and your neighborhood. Thank you so much for your time. All thank right. you so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right. With that, we close item F1. We move on to item F2, which is another use permit. This is at 1152 Berkeley Avenue. This is a request for use permit to add a first floor addition and conduct interior modifications to an existing non-conforming single family residence, again in the R1U single family urban residential zoning district. The proposed new work value would exceed 75% of the replacement value of the existing structure in a 12 month period and requires approval of a use permit by the planning commission. Once again, I turn to you, Mr. Pruder. Thank you again, Chair DeCardi. At this time, staff have no updates or announcements to make, but we're happy to answer any questions before we proceed with the applicant's remarks. Thank you. Any clarifying questions for staff? All right, seeing none and seeing a camera coming on, I'm guessing I'm turning it to you, Mr. Ray, is that correct? Uh, yes, hello, thank you. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair DeCarty and commissioners. Uh, this is an application for an existing single story family residence um, in the Bellhaven neighborhood uh, on an existing non-conforming lot. And it also has a, a side yard wall that encroaches on the uh, required side yard, which will be um, an existing non-conforming condition that's gonna remain. Um, it's a single story addition. There's gonna be very minor impact on the, um, on the existing uh, neighborhood visually. And that's about all I have to say about it. Um, 
the owners are here to add their comments if they'd like. Tyree. Yeah, we're here. Can you can you hear us? I can't see. I can't see we, myself, but I'm here. We can hear you. Yes, if you if the floor is yours. But the host has asked to start the video. Okay, here we go. Yeah, we're just trying to. Hello, everybody. Thanks for hearing us out. We're just trying to add on to the house. It's a little small and trying to update it. You know, we're grandparents now. We just want an extra room and a bathroom for when the grandchildren come to visit. You know, host like. Christmas and family dinners and stuff like that. It's just trying to update the house. We've been in the neighborhood for like, I think this house like 21 years and we're just trying to, we don't plan on going anywhere. So we're just trying to be comfortable. Terrific. All and right. I would like to add that this house has been in our family since the early seventies. My parents purchased it for my grandmother um, who moved in from Louisiana. So it's been a family home since the early seventies. So. It's time for an upgrade. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> you have, uh, that home has seen a lot of changes uh, in the intervening years. So. It has. <laughs> <laughs> yes. well, well, thank you and thank you for being here. Um, all right, with that, any questions uh, of the applicant before we turn to public comment to the commissioners? All right, seeing none, we'll then move to public comment. Uh, on item F2, I'll turn it over to Mr. Pruder. Thank you again, Chair DeCardi. At this time, I don't see any hands raised, but as an additional reminder for the members of the public interested in commenting, please press the hand icon or dial star nine if you wish to speak at this time. We can wait another moment. I uh, still don't see any hands. Yeah, let's just wait a moment. Commissioner Riggs's cattail is gonna entertain us here for a minute. <laughs> All right, anybody? Still see no hands, so please feel free to proceed. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and close public comment and we'll bring it back to the virtual dais for commissioners for any comments, questions, uh, Commissioner Barnes. Thank you, Commissioner Ducardi. Uh, this to me uh, is a perfectly approvable project. What we're talking about is a first floor addition and some interior modifications the two non-conforming aspects of it are 4.2 feet on the right side when it um, when five feet are required, which is not unusual. It certainly was the same as my house before I did my renovation. And then the residence being built with one required off-street parking space in the existing one-car garage. Um, I'm noting that on this project, all the zoning ordinance requirements um, are met and the scale materials and style of the proposed residence certainly is in, um, consistent with the aesthetic approach of the neighborhood. So for those reasons, um, I move that the project uh, be approved for the staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. So we have a first per the staff report. I see Commissioner Riggs. Yes, thank you. Um, before making a comment uh, through the chair, I'd just like to ask uh, a clarifying question of planning of staff. Um, for the benefit of those who um, may find that they need to go through this process, uh, just to clarify, it's a fairly extensive set of drawings for planning approval for what appears probably to most people to be a, a very low impact um, uh, effort here where uh, the street front is not changed, uh, no second story is involved, and, um, uh, and yet we ask for a great deal of detail on the planning submittal. And um, if, uh, if I could be so bold, I'll, I'll ask if staff could just briefly explain why we, um, we asked that level of information for this level of project. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs, for your question. Um, I think just uh, apologies again for the barking in the background, um, but uh, I would just point out that it's specific, I think, to different projects when we have use permits to come in 
But in this case, uh, it's a little unfortunate, I think, in the fact that it has a few different factors to account for. So for example, we have an addition um, that is of considerable size that would require topographic survey, boundary and topographic survey. So that's, that's one sheet there. We have a lot of factoring in of non-conforming work, non-conforming work value. So we need to be very clear on documenting the floor area and the building coverage for the site. And because we are documenting those things, we need diagrams and we need calculations for those areas in question. So that creates you know, an additional sheet or so um, for a project that is for a non-conforming structure. In addition to that, we have an addition, an actual addition to a house that you know, will be going to planning commission. So we need to know about how the elevations are changing um, along that area that's being affected. We also had some uh, lesser modifications on the existing uh, fabric of the exterior of the house. And so we needed to factor those in. And so what happens is you have, you know, a set of existing and proposed elevations. That's eight, eight elevations right there. And then you also have floor plans that differ from existing to proposed. So you have a lot of these drawings that need to show the existing and the proposed condition. And so that creates kind of double of everything. And so I think generally speaking, that sums up the, the bulk of the sheets. And then we also, for planning commission purposes, always require an area plan and a streetscape diagram that show the conditions when looking you know, toward the front of the house with the neighboring uh, properties on each side. And then of course the area plan to give the greater context. And so it's basically the nature of this project, which I would say is very common for any non-conforming work value based use permit um, that we would need these, this level of detail, these, these number of sheets. All right, Mr. Pruder, thank you very much for sharing that. I think that helps people who are observing what they think might be their scope, potential scope of work. So they have an idea of what uh, to look forward to, if that's the right phrase. Um, so uh, with that, I would like to second the motion by Mr. Barnes. All right, we have a first and a second um, for approval of the staff report as submitted. Any questions or comments from commissioners before we move to a vote? All right, seeing none in alphabetical order, Commissioner Barnes? Yes. Commissioner Doe? Yes. Vice Chair Harris? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Riggs? Yes. Commissioner Tate? Yes. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. I will vote yes as well. That's seven in favor. Um, congratulations on your expanding home. May you enjoy your grandchildren for many, many years when they visit. Thanks. Thank you. Thank appreciate you. Thank it. you. We appreciate it. All right. Well, we appreciate you in our community. Be well. Thank you. All right. With that, let me close item F2. Can you close the screen? Um, I'll do it. Ms. Sammeyer, did you get that? We're on informational items, I believe. Perfect, thank you. I apologize, I think my computer froze for a moment. Um, so for informational items first, we have, we're gonna have back-to-back -back meetings September 12th and September 19th. Um, so for September 12th, we have 1350 Adams Court, and that's a new research and development project research and development building that's part of an existing development. And then um, we have 135 El Camino Real. So that's the redevelopment um, of a small commercial building um, and it's proposed as a mixed use residential and office building. And then for September 19th, um, we don't yet have the um, exact list of projects um, and that, but that notice will be going out um, this Friday. And so that concludes my updates, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Ms. Sandmeyer. Any questions from commissioners? 
I have one, Miss Sam Meyer, which is a follow-up to a, I think it was a question that Commissioner Thomas raised at the last time, which was interest in clarity about the intersection between ADU processing and heritage tree policy. Uh, and there was some thought that maybe that we could get that in writing or there might be some way to do that. I wondered if, I realized that was fairly recent, but I wondered if you had any update on how that, that, that might be um, being looked at. Yeah, um, we're looking at, you know, possibility of doing a memo or something similar, or certainly having the city attorney or someone from the city attorney's office attend um, the next time there's a situation where there is an ADU and um, heritage tree removal based on development. Um, but certainly, there's a lot of um, different factors involved. So. Um, but yeah, I don't have anything at this time, but um, I'm certainly keeping that in mind. Great, thank you. That was all that, exactly what I was looking for. So I appreciate the update on, on both of those potential pathways for us and we'll look forward to whenever that makes sense. Any other questions or updates, commissioners? All right, with that, I am going to close item G and move to H for adjournment in former chair Doran-esque fashion. We are concluding well before 8 p.m. this evening. I wish you all a good rest of your evening and rest of August, and we'll see you for back-to-back -back in September. Have a good evening, everybody. Good night. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Thank you.